Hey everyone, welcome to another session of Power Server Beats as every Wednesday. My name is Marco and last week we talked about Autosar, these three dimensions, whether we're talking about the consortium, the architecture, or the platform. So there's uh, three ways to look into this word. And uh, I hope this is now clear for all of us. And now this week, we're going to talk about the adaptive platform. So Autosar, the consortium, releases two platforms, classic platform and the adaptive platform. So uh, we have been talking mostly about the classic platform. And now this video is going to be about the motivation for the adaptive platform. So it's going to be a little bit long. So if you don't have time to watch this video, you can search for it in YouTube. I'm going to upload this as well there. So this is something that really excites me because we're talking here about the future, about what's coming from the for the next years. And as we know, these new trends, automated driving, connectivity, electrification, insured services, are the ones that really um, are moving, revolutionizing the market. They are usually called as ACEs. So these are the trends that are moving the market. And how are these moving it? So first of all, we're gonna, we have to sit in an economic perspective. So uh, there's a lot of things going on in this chart. So I'm gonna explain this bit by bit. So first of all here, yep, this is how the market looks today. Actually, this comes from a report from 2015. And so uh, this is the size of the market, 3,500. And um, this is also separated in three sections, basically one time vehicle sales, then aftermarket. And now this section that, as you can see, uh, grows a lot is from uh, income coming from recurring revenues, um, which is related to these new trends, share mobility, data connectivity services. So um, the expectation is that this section will eventually take as, as much as 30% of the total market by 2000. Um, 30. So if it wasn't because of this, then the market will only grow 2% or well, just for, for one time vehicle sales. Because, but then because of aftermarket and these recurring revenues, it is expected that the automotive market will grow by 4.4% per year. So the future is really exciting and it's going to move a lot of things around the value chain. So there is a strong motivation for these trends to happen. So um, what implications does these new trends have? Uh, first of all, it's going to uh, revolutionize the internal architecture of the vehicle, the electrical and electronic architecture of the vehicle. So uh, first, this is how things are today. Um, these are the different generations of the vehicle electrical and electronic architecture. 
the first generation, which uh, happened in the 80s, is characterized by isolated ECUs that were not, talk were not talking to each other. Then um, when, with the presentation, or let's say the invention of the CAN bus, then new connections between ECUs happened. This uh, uh, in the 90s and 2000s. And um, as of today, we are trans doing the transition to this new architecture where the domains are separated by this central gateway. So this gateway allows uh, each domain to talk to each other. So this is something that is um, happening in the current generations. And it is expected that in the next generations, we will move towards a domain-based architecture with domain controllers. And still, we will have the central gateway, but more, more of the computing power will be uh, yeah, transferred to these domain controllers. So if we want to uh, categorize these generations, we can say that the second and the third generation uh, is a distributed system, whereas the fourth generation can also be a distributed system, but also can be a decentralized system. So there's some uh, argument arguments for each uh, one of those. But then the important thing here is that these um, architectures, these generations were created with uh, human drivers in mind. So basically the human was in charge of gathering and processing the information coming from the environment and also uh, acting as the as the actuator or the, or the driver of the car. But now the question is if these architectures will be enough considering the new paradigm of having a robot being the driver of our car. So that's basically the central question here. So we gotta, we have to first see what are the implications of having a robot driver. First of all, and most importantly, more data. The intelligence from the self-driving car come from acquiring and processing different sensor data. For example, camera, uh, navigation, radars, lidars, and so on. So it is expected that the number of sensors will increase by a lot with each new um, automation level. So um, how much more data are we talking about here? We said that it, it implies more data, but how much more and how much more processing is needed in order to analyze this data? So as I was mentioning, for each one of these automation levels, we're gonna expect more and more sensors and of different types, whether they are cameras, radars, or lidars. They're gonna generate from three gigabits per second of data up to 40 gigabit per second or more. These are just the uh, estimations, but all we can say is that we expect a lot, a lot of data that needs to be processed. So 
regarding the question, how much more processing? Um, these are just some numbers uh, for comparison, but this is the real number that we're talking about. 1 million DMIPs at least. Uh, to put that in comparison to actual microprocessors, the Intel Core i9 has this amount of DMIPs. So we're going to need new architectures, new types of processors, heterogeneous architectures. I'm going to explain that actually in the next slide. But then, OK, the constraints for the current um, platform, the current paradigm, is that the in vehicle communication is not up to the future needs. We have a gateway that will represent a bottleneck when communicating between domains. And also, well, the, 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 the most uh, used technology, which is CAN bus, is of course not up to the, the speed that is needed or the throughput that is needed. Another constraint is that uh, re, uh, regarding AutoSAR is that the classic platform was originally designed for single core microcontrollers. So as we have mentioned, we are now talking about uh, um, pressing power that is uh, way ahead of what the classic platform or a single core could handle. So the solution for these new uh, needs is to create, as we were mentioning, an heterogeneous platform that will be um, created using microprocessors, GPUs, NPUs, and so on. Maybe FPGAs, who knows. Um, also, um, creating a domain-based, either a domain-based or a centralized electrical electronic architecture. Getting rid of the gateway will allow for uh, more efficient uh, collaboration between the vehicle uh, sensors and actuators, the different domains. And also we need another technology for the intra vehicle communication and Ethernet will become uh, very important for this new goal. Also regarding the architecture, uh, the idea is to move to a service oriented architecture. Uh, maybe I can explain that in a later video, of course but that's basically the expectation. So um, this is confirmed. These heterogeneous architectures are confirmed by how the market has been moving regarding the microcontrollers that are, or microprocessors that are being used or systems of, or, or, systems and chip that are being used now in the market. We move from single core to uh, multi-core CPUs, and now we're moving to some architectures that are created using 12 CPUs plus uh, GPUs plus, plus neural processing units. And um, yeah, as you can see, this is how things are moving now. So the classic platform was created considering these aspects, at least uh, 
It was created for the second and third generation of electrical and electronic architecture. And these architectures were uh, created considering the human as a driver. But now, with all that has been explained, we now need to move to a domain-based architecture and eventually we will move to a centralized architecture. And that's where the adaptive platform becomes relevant since it is basically used for this type of architectures. So that's basically the motivation for having uh, the adaptive platform. Next week, uh, I'm gonna continue talking about the adaptive platform, uh, basically still um, about the motivation and also uh, what are the relevant things about it. Talk about the uh, service-oriented architecture and uh, maybe compare it to classic platform. Although it doesn't make sense to compare it since it gives the wrong idea that it is a replacement. No, the expectation is that the classic platform will still be needed for deeply embedded systems. And now the adaptive platform will be used for another type of ECU. Uh, we're gonna talk about that in the next session. So thank you for uh, your attention. Um, don't forget to subscribe to the hashtag here, AutoServits. Also, if you like, uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. So in case you don't have time to follow uh, this, this video, you can later watch it either using the hashtag or uh, in, in YouTube if you prefer that platform. So thank you. Have a, a nice uh, rest of the week and uh, see you next week. Bye.